Good morning, it's July 17th. We're reading through the Bible in a year, and today we've reached some very famous Psalms. Psalm 22, 23, and 24. Now, I know you know Psalm 22 because as soon as you read verse 1, you'll immediately recognize that from the Gospels. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me is how that starts. And you'll know that from the scene where Christ is on the cross and he quotes the first part of this psalm. And it brings up so many questions for people. How can it be that Jesus is God and saying God has forsaken him? And how does that all work? And we need to remember that, of course, there is a connection to the Uh, substitutionary atonement of Christ that he takes on and absorbs uh, our justice, the justice from the Father. And there's a sense in which there is that darkness over the land, recognizing the severity and gravity of him being the target of the Father's justice and judgment. Uh, We get that. But the focus of that statement is not just the opening line, it's the whole psalm. And as you read through it, read through it carefully and watch how many things in this Davidic psalm are actually messianic references to what's coming. I mean, the being scorned and despised, well, that's a pretty universal idea, but the idea of having his garments divided, having his hands and his feet pierced, um, you know, all of these issues of the cross as you see that scene looking back on what happened Uh, from the gospel's perspective, you see, I mean, you look from the gospel's perspective back at David's psalm and you see the connections everywhere in this psalm. So certainly Jesus in quoting it was getting people's mind back to this text. I certainly knew the Bible better than we do back in the day, not the Roman soldiers necessarily, but the uh, Jewish people that stood around watching this fulfillment of scripture. So, uh, and in the end, watch how it ends. The idea of of being sure of redemption and and life and telling of the, the Lord's name in the congregation and among the brothers, all those things point to not only the death of Christ, but the resurrection uh, veiled as it is. Psalm 23, uh, not much I can say about that. You're so familiar with the words. It's such a great psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, which is interesting in John 10. Jesus comes along and says, he is the good shepherd. Uh, David here says, the Lord is my shepherd. And that picture of David being a shepherd and a shepherd of Israel, not only a shepherd back when he was a boy, but a shepherd as a political leader, now looking to the Lord as his shepherd, Jesus comes on the scene and he says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep hear my my voice. Um, the messianic overtones there, clearly, uh, and Jesus makes those references uh, for us himself. And then Psalm 24, another messianic set of references here about the coming Messiah, starting with a great statement that's true and should be in our minds, um, at the front of our minds all the time. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything that's in it, of course, is God's. And uh, all things, as I often quote from uh, Romans 11, are from him and through him and to him. He's created everything. He sustains everything. And everything is for the king. And he is our king. So uh, that's a great start to this. But then we see all those statements about uh, the the ascending to the holy hill of the Lord and about the king of glory. And uh, just a great set of psalms for us to read and thinking about the fullness fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of all these statements in the New Testament. Our New Testament reading is in Acts chapter 20. Uh, Paul goes to Macedonia for three months. Uh, He has a long sermon there that uh, lulls Eutychus to sleep on the third floor window seal, the third story rather, yeah, window seal. He falls out and he's considered to be dead at that point. Paul comes and raises him up. That's a very significant um, situation, of course. Very few resurrections, um, resuscitations, we might say, in the Bible of someone who died and then comes back to life. Uh, no one came back to life in a glorified body other than Christ. He's the first fruits and therefore in the and therefore the firstborn of the dead, as First Corinthians 15 says. But here we have have, um, one of the few, less than 10 resurrections. You can count one of them as a group. There might be more obviously than that at Christ's death in Matthew 27, but um, significant story that the apostolic um, authority is seen through the raising here of Eutychus. Now, our New Testament imperative today is a, is a joyful one. It's found in Romans 15, 32. Uh, Paul says, I, I hope that uh, by God's will, I can come to you with joy and may be refreshed in your company. And that's just a great statement there about us being together, having time together, purposing to be joyful and finding the refreshment that comes from that. That's just a great thing. And even in the lexicons, the scholarly lexicons talking about the suggestion of kind of a time of relaxation and putting our feet up. That's how I might put it after the public service and the work that is done by the Apostle Paul. And it's a great picture of you kind of letting your hair down, so to speak, and putting your feet up and having times with Christians, with your brothers and sisters in Christ, where you 
come away feeling refreshed. And to purpose to go into that joyfully, that's the only way you can do that. So I put it this way, find joyful refreshment in Christian company. So do that today if you would at some point, uh, if not today, soon, to find joyful refreshment in Christian company. So spend some time with some Christians and be sure to recharge your uh, your batteries as it relates to kind of having that synergistic energy and the joy that comes from being with other uh, followers of Christ. We'll be back tomorrow as we continue our reading through the Bible. Mm-hmm.